father to a five years old girl called Yasmina. A three years old boy, I named Omar after his grandfather. I'm also a Jerusalemite, civil engineer by training, and also a member of Mila. I was born in Kuwait in 1979 to two Palestinian parents who left before who left before that to seek opportunity and a better life away from recently occupied East Jerusalem. I'm the grandson of one of the first administrative prisoners in Jerusalem, after whom I was called, and I'm a proud participant in the Palestinian struggle for freedom, dignity, and self-determination. Tonight, I'm your moderator on behalf of the 28 uh, members of uh, Mila's Palestine chapter, one of our members, unfortunately, will not be joining us tonight. He's the only member from Gaza, and he was forced to evacuate his house and his, his, his parents' houses after they were bombed. Today, we uh, got the information that he safely arrived in Egypt after the crossing was open tonight. Uh, we just pray for him and his family to be safe and uh, for the people in Gaza who are facing horrific avalanche of suffering, uh, steadfastness, and safety. As for the uh, for the session tonight, we'll have 15 minutes for each uh, of our speakers, and then I will leave it to a Q&A session. You can share with us your questions in the, uh, in the message box, and uh, we'll try to filter the questions so that there aren't <clears throat> any repetitive ones. And uh, please make your questions direct, write one question at a time, and uh, if possible, direct your question to one of our speakers. Please understand that this session uh, will be recorded to be shared uh, uh, later on. So we just wanted to let you know that uh, of this information. I'll start with the first speaker. Dr. Mustafa Barghouti. Our first speaker for this evening is Dr. Mustafa Barghouti. Mustafa Barghouti is the founder and leader of the Palestinian National Initiative, a presidential candidate for the Palestinian Authority in 2005, in which he, he came second to Mr. Mahmoud Abbas, the sitting president. In 2006, Dr. Barghouti was elected as a member of the Palestinian parliament and he, he assumed the role of the Minister of Information under the 2007 National Unity Government. He is the founder and president of the board of the Palestinian Medical Relief Society. He's an outspoken advocate for internal reform, an international spokesperson for the Palestinian cause, and a leading figure in the nonviolent popular resistance against the Israeli occupation and apartheid, an organizer of international solidarity presence in Palestine. He is a physician by training, a social, political, human rights, and peace activist who is regarded as one of the most active grassroots leaders in Palestine that campaigns for the development of the Palestinian society and the grassroots democracy. For all that work, he was a nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2010. Dr. Barghouti writes extensively for local and international audiences on civil society, democracy, health, development policies and the political and the political aspects in Palestine. He recently published The Ploy of the Century, Dimensions and Confrontational Strategies, a book about the so-called the deal of the century, which is, you may know it as well as the Trump peace plan. Uh, Dr. Barwuthi, I turn to you. Uh, yeah. Dr. Barwuthi is going to talk to us uh, about the current situation in Gaza, the uh, the uh, the crimes that are taking place and uh, will shed light on the political aspects of the situation, the context, and uh, possibly his uh, vision for the for the immediate future and the consequences of the latest war. Thank you so much, and uh, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. Uh, I thank you for your interest. And uh, I uh, will try to summarize as much as I can. I have to apologize that because after my speech, I will have to leave you and then come back, I hope, because of something urgent that I have to attend to. 
Uh, I want to start by saying that the situation here did not start on the 7th of October. Uh, when uh, Hamas uh, conducted an attack on the Israeli side. Uh, the situation, as Mr. Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations said, uh, what happened on the 7th of October did not come out from a vacuum. It came out from a situation where Palestinian people have been subjected to ethnic cleansing since 1948, where 70% of the Palestinian population were forced out of their land after the Israeli troops committed more than 50 massacres and uh, erased to the ground more than 520 Palestinian communities. 70% of the people of Gaza were victims of this ethnic cleansing and are refugees who were displaced from their homeland and then occupied not once, but many times. The other aspect is that we've been under Israeli military occupation in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem since 1967, 56 years of military occupation. I'm sure my colleague, uh, Mitri, will speak to you more about the details of that. But being under military occupation all your life is something that I experienced. And it means a life without rights, a life without uh, future, a life without opportunity, and with lots of difficulties. But on top of that, we've been subjected to something that I can describe as the worst apartheid ever in human history. A racial discriminatory system where Palestinians were not allowed to be equal citizens. And during all these years, 75 years, the United Nations made 1,000 resolutions, the General Assembly. And the Security Council took 84 resolutions that were never implemented. All of these resolutions spoke about Palestinians' rights, and they were never implemented. I am a person who calls always for nonviolence. I don't support the killing of any civilian, whether Israeli or Palestinian. But what we've seen during the last 37 horrible days is a process of dehumanization of the whole Palestinian people by the Israeli establishment to justify no less than three war crimes that are taking place today in Gaza. The crime of genocide, the crime of collective punishment, and the crime of any cleansing. This is not a war on Hamas, as Israel claims. It's a war on all Palestinian people. And the real plan that Netanyahu had and is trying to conduct is to really ethnically cleanse all of Gaza Strip. He and his spokesperson declared in the very first days of his military campaign on Gaza that their goal is to evict everybody in Gaza to Egypt, which means ethnically cleanse these Palestinians one more time. And uh, one of his ministers, Mr. Minister Eliyahu, the minister of uh, one of the Israeli ministers, the minister of heritage, said that Israel should throw a nuclear bomb on the people of Gaza. And they spoke about the final solution of Gaza. The problem that Israel faces is the fact that regardless of the fact that 7 million Palestinians are still refugees outside Palestine, not allowed to come home. Our numbers on the land of historic Palestine, which includes Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, have become equal, if not a little bit more than the Jewish Israeli people. And I think their, their plan is clearly to use what ha happened on the 7th of October to get rid of 2.3 million people, to change and fix what they think is the demographic formula. And things did not start on that day, as I said. Before that, during the, the first eight months of this year, 248 Palestinians were killed by the Israeli troops in the West Bank, and uh, 40 of them were children. Today, Gaza is one of the most densely populated areas in the world. 2.3 million people living in, all, in less than 140 square miles have been subjected to continuous bombardment by airstrikes, by artillery, and by tanks, airstrikes that Palestinians have nothing to defend themselves with against, and indiscriminate bombardment 
the result of which up till now is 11,200 civilian Palestinians killed, including no less than 6,000 children. Of those children, 1,500 are still under the rubble because nobody can take them out because the bombardment continues. 28,000 people have been injured. If what happened in Gaza and in the United States of America, considering the ratio of population, you would be speaking about 1,700,000 people killed and 3.5 million people injured in less than a month. That is bigger than all the number of, of, of Americans killed in all the wars that America was involved in since in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. What the Israelis threw in Gaza up to now is 38,000 tons of explosives. This is much bigger than the explosive power of the bomb that was thrown in Hirosh on Hiroshima during the Second World War. 10 kilograms of explosives for every child, every woman, and every man in Gaza. Destruction of 50% of all homes. Destruction of hospitals. Uh, destruction of no less than 220 schools, 32 health centers. The killing of no less than 198 doctors, nurses, and health workers. 56 journalists. 33 ambulances, 1,010 families, and I mean by a family here, the extended families, because we usually, in Gaza, that's how people live. You have the grandfather, the grandmother, all the brothers and the sisters, the children and their grandchildren. Up till now, 1,010 families of those have been erased completely from the civil record because of the Israeli bombardment. What we see is a combination of horrible crimes, but also a huge act of vengeance and revenge. I was very touched by the, 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 the speech of a, an Israeli woman who lost her daughter on the 7th of October. And of course, we feel sorry for her. She said, I lost my daughter, but revenge and vengeance is not the right way. The number of Palestinians killed so far has been bigger than the total number of people killed in Libya during the last flood and Morocco during the last earthquake. But in these countries, they received help, they received support, countries brought lots of things to help them. In our case, we got nothing because of the collective punishment that Israel is conducting, preventing anything from entering Gaza. On usual days, Gaza needs 500 trucks of supplies of food, water, fuel, every day, which means now they need about 18,500 trucks. What was allowed into Gaza up till now is no more than 900 trucks. And nothing was allowed to reach the central Gaza, the city of Gaza, or the north of Gaza. Every four minutes, a Palestinian is killed. Every seven minutes, a Palestinian child is killed. Every 15 minutes, a Palestinian woman is killed. And surprisingly, astonishingly, the United States of America and Great Britain insist of opposing resolution about immediate ceasefire in the United Nations Security Council. As Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, said, the total number of Palestinians killed in the last three weeks, now four weeks, is bigger than the total number of all children killed worldwide in all the wars during the last three years. And on top of that, we are subjected to collective punishment, as I said. Nothing is allowed into the hospitals in the north or in the center. Up till now, 21 hospitals out of 30, 36 stopped working because of lack of fuel. We receive calls from different hospitals since yesterday telling us they don't have water, they don't have food, they don't have oxygen, and they don't have electricity. More than 
nine children have died because incubators don't have oxygen and don't have uh, and don't have electricity in the Shifa hospital, the largest hospital in Gaza. 10 people died because the respirators don't work anymore. Many others will die because they cannot get kidney dialysis. And it's, it's beyond description. Add to that the fact that our colleagues told us that they've done what they have, what they've, what they've never thought they would ever do, which is to operate on people without anesthesia including amputating the, the leg of a, an injured person without anesthesia. We're not in the Stone Age, but Gaza is driven into that direction. We are very worried about the fact that because there is no clean water and there is destruction of the infrastructure, we will start to see outbreaks of epidemics, hepatitis, typhoid, cholera possibly, and definitely measles because there is no vaccination for children for 36 years. 50,000 women are pregnant. They don't have any care. They don't have proper food. And 5,500 of them are giving birth this month. And many have already given birth in the streets because their homes were destroyed and they have no place to go to. This is a very serious situation. I don't have the time to speak about future political solution, but there are only one of three ways. Either the way that Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel is committing today, and I believe he's a war criminal, and more than that, he's a provocator of the worst type of anti-Semitism, which we refuse because of the, what he is doing to the Palestinian people. But uh, the, what he's doing is ethnic cleansing for him, the solution of the Palestinian presence here is ethnic cleansing, and that should not be accepted. There are two other ways. Either Israel would take out their illegal settlers, according to international law, from the occupied West Bank and allow us to have a small independent state in what is called, called two-state solution. Or we should live together in one democratic state with equal rights. But to eliminate Palestinians is impossible. To kill our aspiration to be free is impossible. We will never give up. We will never give up our rights. And we will struggle with everything we have to achieve just lasting peace. Peace based on equality, on respecting our dignity, and our right to be free and dignified. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa. I understand uh, that you have uh, to, to leave us for uh, 20 minutes uh, or so. So I'll start with the uh, second speaker and we'll wait for you to come back uh, to, and to respond to some of the questions from our participants. Uh, thank you again for this presentation. Thank you. Right now, we'll... Uh, as Dr. Mustafa explained, the situation in Gaza, um, speaking about the uh, the human toll and the uh, the difficulties, the hardships and the suffering that is being raining on our people in Gaza, I would like to uh, for you to to also hear uh, the perspective of Dr. Mitri. Uh, let me present to you to you Dr. Mitri Rahib. Reverend uh, Professor Mitri Rahib is the founder and resident of Dar el Kalim University in Bethlehem. He is considered uh, the most widely published Palestinian theologian to this date. Dr. Rahib is the author and editor of around uh, 50 books, including Decolonizing, Pal Decolonizing Palestine, The Land, the People, the Bible, In the Eye of the Storm, Middle Eastern Christians in the Age of Empire, the Bible Through Palestinian Eyes, and many other books. His books and numerous articles have been translated so far into 13 languages. So hopefully you'll have the chance to get your hands on some of these books. Uh, Reverend Rahib served as the senior pastor of the Christmas Lutheran Church in Bethlehem from June 1987 
to May 2017, and as the president of the Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in, the, in Jordan and the Holy Land from 2011 to 2016. As a social entrepreneur, Reverend Rahib has founded several NGOs, including the Christian Academic Forum for Citizenship in the Arab World. He is the founding and board member of the National Library of Palestine and a founding member of Bright Stars of Bethlehem, which is a nonprofit or organization registered in the United States. He is an elected member of the Palestinian National Council, as well as the Palestinian Central Council, uh, the two most important bodies in the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Reverend Dr. Rahib received in 2022 an honorary doctorate of divinity from Wartburg, Wartburg Theological Seminary in Iowa, USA. In 2017, he received the Tolerance Award from the European Academy of Science and Arts and many other awards. He also received for his outstanding contribution to Christian education through research and publication, an honorary doctorate from Concordia University in Chicago in 2003, and for his interfaith work, the International Muhammad Nafi Chelbi Peace Award, and many other awards as well. The work of Dr. Rahib has received wide media attention from major international media outlets and networks around the world. Dr. Rahib holds a doctorate in theology from Phillips University at Marburg, Germany. He is married to Najwa Khouri and has two daughters, Dana and Tala. Dr. Rahib, uh, the time is yours. Uh, Dr. Rahib is going to uh, uh, to present us a uh, few slides, and uh, uh, he will kindly share his, his screen with us right now. Uh, thank you, Badawi, and uh, it's uh, great to be with uh, all of you uh, uh, this evening. Um, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Mustafa uh, gave you like the a macro perspective, I would like to dive a bit into the uh, micro. And uh, what I would like to do is to share with you five uh, vignettes uh, of life uh, in Gaza, but I would like to start in Bethlehem, where I'm located. Um, and uh, sometimes when we speak about Gaza, it sounds that is something far away from us, in the West Bank, but I wanted actually to show you is that Gaza is very close, very close to us. Uh, and it, it becomes very personal for me uh, personally. And this is what I would like uh, to show you uh, this evening. So five uh, vignettes. And as I said, uh, I would like to start with an eye on Bethlehem. Um, Christmas is around the corner, uh, but this is where I was born. Um, and uh, for those of you maybe who are not uh, aware of the geography, Bethlehem is located just south of Jerusalem, like eight miles. And if you look at this uh, map uh, of the West Bank, uh, you can see that everything that is violet is actually under uh, full Israeli control. And the green uh, spots that you see everywhere are uh, Jewish settlements built or colonies built on the West Bank. If you look carefully, you can recognize uh, two vertical lines of, uh, uh, of settlements and three horizontal lines. They make a grid. And uh, this grid, actually, uh, the idea for it was imported from South Africa. The late uh, Prime Minister, Israeli Prime Minister Sharon, went to South Africa to see how the white there can control the black. And he came uh, back with this idea, if we do a grid, this will make sure that no Palestinian state can evolve in the West Bank. And secondly, we can control the Palestinian demography. Now, uh, Bethlehem is the second uh, most affected city by the wall. Um, the most affected city by the wall is a city called Kalkilia. And if you look at it from an aerial perspective, you can see a wall surrounding Kalkilia from all sides. This is, in fact, what's happening in Gaza as well, surrounded from all sides 
either by walls uh, or uh, from the sea, it is besieged. Uh, I would like to look just quickly into the Bethlehem governorate uh, or county, um, just to, to give you a taste of what's happening in the West Bank, because it's really not only about Gaza. The whole of Palestine uh, is right now uh, um, uh, experiencing uh, war. So this is the Bethlehem County or government uh, back in 1967. If you look at the square kilometers, it's more or less twice the, the size of the Gaza Strip. We have around 220,000 living in the Bethlehem uh, government. In Gaza, we have 2.3 million, so 10 times more uh, in uh, half the size of uh, Bethlehem. Uh, look what happened slowly to Bethlehem to understand the settler colonial project that Israel is doing. First, Israel annexed the northern part of Bethlehem, declared it part of Jerusalem. Then uh, in the last, in the first 40 years, they built uh, uh, 19 Jewish settlements on Bethlehem land. If you look carefully where they are built, they are built either southwest uh, of Bethlehem. Why southwest? Because this is the most fertile area. Uh, or they are built on uh, along the Dead Sea because they control the minerals, tourism, etc. And then you have these four, like in the middle of nowhere, uh, and you ask yourself, why are they there? Because they sit on the largest under, uh, underground water aquifer of our region. So they sit literally on the water, the Israeli. All of this, what you see in, in, in blue, is under full Israeli control, uh, as if that was not uh, enough. Uh, also, what you see here is military zone. So we are not even allowed to be there. Uh, and uh, then Israel built so-called uh, bypass roads, two bypass roads. Bypass roads that are roads that uh, actually connect Jewish settlements together by bypassing Palestinian towns. But in this uh, in this case, they have a different function, because if you look at the at at the uh, uh, at the uh, road to the left, we are not allowed anymore to build uh, to the uh, left of that road. And if you look to the other road on the right, we are not allowed to build right of that road, which means these two roads uh, are confining Bethlehem. Uh, you can see how uh, uh, Jewish settlements, colonies continue to expand, to mushroom. Uh, then came the wall that surrounds Bethlehem from three sides, the Bethlehem city uh, with Bejala, Bethlehem. Uh, and uh, you have checkpoints, barriers. And this is right now what you see in blue, the Jewish settlements that Israel is building currently. And if you look carefully, you can see how Israel is surrounding Bethlehem from the east now and from the north. Which really means if you take the 66, the 60 percent, which is so-called Area C, put to it the 20 percent, which is the nature reserve, you will uh, you have to say that actually uh, uh, 86 percent of uh, the land of Bethlehem is not under. Palestinian control. We have only 14% under our own control. So uh, if you want to understand the concept behind it, it's really the Swiss cheese uh, is the best example to clarify what's happening. Israel gets the cheese uh, and the Palestinians are pushed in the holes. This is what's happening. Uh, this is what uh, uh, Dr. Barghouthi uh, described as apartheid. And so for the city, uh, if a city, I mean, we cannot move freely. So if I want to go to Jerusalem, I need a permit, absence of freedom. Imagine you are an architect. We have here, I'm sure, many architects. You want to do city planning, but you are not allowed to uh, build, uh, I mean, to expand, uh, uh, to grow. 
uh, which led to the deteriorating the character of the town. Economically, if a city cannot expand, it will have uh, rising unemployment. Socially, if you look people down, you will have tensions, crime, drugs. Uh, psychologically, uh, there is no green space in Bethlehem left. Uh, imagine your kids growing up without knowing how spring smells or look like. And for Christians in Bethlehem, this means migration. Why bother? Uh, so bottom line, deteriorating quality of life. And this is a deliberate and man-made catastrophe. This is not a tsunami. This is not an earthquake. This is man-made catastrophe. Why I'm saying this? Because what's happening in Gaza on a larger scale is happening in Bethlehem on a small scale and is happening in every Palestinian town slowly but surely. Israel is destroying life in not only in Gaza, but in all Palestinian uh, territories. As if this was not uh, enough, Israel now after October uh, 7th uh, sealed the city. So they put, as you can see here, the blocks. So we cannot move with our cars uh, outside uh, of Bethlehem. And this is true for every Palestinian town right now. And uh, every day, almost, uh, Israeli military uh, come into the Palestinian cities and detain people. Uh, and so far, uh, you can see the numbers that uh, Israel arrested just in this last month. Uh, this is a picture that you can see now often in, on Palestinian cities. You have uh, Israeli soldiers marching through the street and they have uh, a Palestinian prisoners, a detainee that they took uh, with closed uh, eyes. So that is just to give you an idea about life in Bethlehem. Let me come to the next point, which is I on a shrinking free space. And uh, for my whole life, I have been working for freedom, free speech, uh, etc. But this is shrinking by the day. It's not only that social media is trying to silence us. Uh, many Palestinians and actually not only Palestinians, people supportive of Palestine uh, were not uh, actually their, uh, uh, their accounts on Facebook, on Twitter, on uh, etc., Instagram, uh, were blocked uh, because they had Palestinian uh, uh, content. Right now, it is very difficult uh, for uh, Palestinians inside the Green Line even to have a post on, uh, on Facebook in supportive of Gaza. On the left, you have Professor Nader Shalhoub, a very well-known uh, scholar. Uh, she teaches at the Hebrew University uh, because of, uh, uh, of um, of her stand, uh, one statement on Gaza, uh, uh, the administration of uh, the Hebrew University sent her a letter asking her to resign from her post. Um, uh, right now, there is a legal battle around that. To the right, you have a very famous Palestinian singer, Dalal Abu Amne. She had one post with one uh, Quranic verse uh, uh, talking about God will give us victory or something like that. She was detained uh, because of that post. So right now, if you are Palestinians inside the Green Line, you are not allowed to, or even in East Jerusalem, you are not allowed to speak in uh, uh, in favor of, of Gaza. Not, not Hamas, just Gaza. This is exactly what happened to one of our students. Uh, she is from the Akko area, so from inside the Green Line, Shams Badran. Uh, she was, uh, right now we are on, uh, all the classes are online. Um, and she was taking the class with our professor. She is studying film. Um, and while she was on Zoom in the class, the Israeli soldier stormed her house. You see it here. Uh, that is a shot from that moment when the Israeli soldiers came in while she was uh, learning and they, they took her and her sister, uh, they detained them for one day and then they had to pay 12,000 shekel equal to 
uh, $3,000, and they confiscated all their electrical equipment, computer, laptop, uh, iPad, uh, uh, iPhone, and they never brought that back to them. But the fight uh, and, and the silencing of Palestinian voices is not only inside the Green Line. Uh, in the States right now, there is a big battle uh, criminalizing, uh, criminalizing Palestine in the Western academia. Actually, uh, uh, Brandeis uh, University in the States was the first university uh, a few days ago to, uh, to ban uh, students for justice in Palestine, declaring them uh, uh, illegal. Uh, Colombia uh, followed suit. So we have, you know, we are facing uh, a war, not only by Israel, actually, but what I call the empire, uh, the Western uh, so-called democratic and free world. Uh, uh, but also journalists uh, 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 here in Canada, actually uh, were dismissed uh, by Global News because uh, she had something on her uh, Facebook uh, in support of Gaza. And just to see how crazy it is, uh, in the churches, there is a woman, Christian woman movement worldwide called World Day of Prayer, which is uh, usually uh, the first week on Ma in March uh, women from all churches all over, around the world, they come together to pray a prayer and the liturgy that is developed by women from one country. Now, next year, it happens that it is the prayer will come from Palestine and women from Jerusalem wrote this prayer. Uh, and the, 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 the theme of the prayer, you can see here to the right, I beg you, this is a quotation from the Bible, I beg you, bear with one another in love. So, I mean, it's really something, uh, I mean, nothing dangerous. Uh, it's, it talks about love. You can see in Germany uh, now, uh, they, uh, they decided uh, actually that this is illegal. Uh, and Germans wrote a prayer on behalf of the Palestinians. Imagine just what that means. And you can see the, the, on the left, uh, the poster uh, that says uh, you have actually women not from Palestine, but from, uh, 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 from uh, Iran. You can see how, how bizarre this, and they say that the, the, uh, the prayers, the text, and the pictures are fu uh, full with a, a hate uh, for Jews, which is nonsense. Uh, uh, but you can see uh, how really even churches in this case are against us. And the last thing that happened now is that even the uh, artificial intelligence uh, is uh, calibrated in a way against us, uh, de dehumanizing us. So if you put uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, uh, you know, he translated differently, or if you put Palestinian, you will have a picture uh, Palestinians with a gun. Now, you ask yourself, I guess, why is this possible? One of the reasons is the weaponization of anti-Semitism. This is why right now, if you uh, tune into CNN or BBC or uh, ARD in Germany or whatever, everyone is talking about anti-Semitism, rising anti-Semitism. Uh, and uh, we are uh, we are uh, against anti-Semitism. We are against uh, Islamophobia. Uh, we are against racism. But when one of those is weaponized, which means is used as weapon to silence people, then there is something wrong. Uh, and I always say, if Israel and its allies will put only one tenth of the energy and funds they put in silencing people to bring peace we would have had peace long time ago. But why is this possible? Uh, how is it possible that all of this is happening? This has to do with the language. 
uh, that is developed to dehumanize Palestinians. So the defense minister of Israel said on October 9th, there will be no electricity, no food, no fuel, everything is closed. That's October 9th. We are now, what, November 13th. So over a month, they are preventing that. And then he continues, we are fighting animal people and we are acting accordingly. This idea of animal human is something that is so racist, but they are so proud of it. Or you hear Netanyahu on October 8th saying, we will turn Gaza into an island of ruins. Again, all of this is happening. This is not wishful thinking. This is not somebody saying something in, in, uh, in, in rage, but this is a planned policy. And then you have Ezra Yachin here, a veteran of the Israeli army, saying, wipe out their families, their mothers, and their children. These animals must not be allowed to live any longer. And, uh, and the, the Israel army spokesperson, who, whom we see now every day, he's saying we are dropping hundreds of tons of bombs in Gaza. We heard it from Dr. Mustafa, 31,000 uh, tons. The focus is on destruction, not accuracy. And then you have Ayelet Shakid saying they should go, as should the physical homes in which they raise the snakes. Otherwise, more little snakes will be raised there. And we heard from, uh, uh, from Dr. Barghuth about the nuclear bomb. The, the interesting thing when, when, uh, when this uh, Israeli minister said that, uh, many Israeli were angry about him. Not because he wants to drop uh, the bomb on Palestinians, but for two reasons. One of them said there are 250 uh, uh, hostages, Israeli Jewish hostages there. They will be killed. It doesn't make sense. And the other group was angry because they said, you know what? Gaza is just too close to Israel. A nuclear bomb might affect us as well. And maybe you heard about uh, Smotrich. Uh, where he say, you are here by mistake. Palestinians are here by mistake because Ben-Gurion didn't finish the job and throw you out in 1948. So they now want to finish the job. So this dehumanization of people is something, if it, if it is uh, done by any other country, uh, all of these people will be in jail. But here... This is becoming a daily rhetoric, uh, uh, and unfortunately, nobody talks about it. I, I work a lot uh, against the hate speech. Uh, I'm in so many groups worldwide that uh, works against hate speech. I haven't seen one of these groups actually uh, taking this issue on. They are all somehow afraid. So I come to the fourth uh, vignette. I on the cultural institutions in Gaza. Because our university works with arts and culture, that's the only thing we do and design. Uh, this is for us of interest. So uh, uh, this is the French uh, cultural center in Gaza that I visited uh, many times. And actually the, the artwork that you see there, these are pictures done by our students in Gaza. Uh, we were having uh, the opening of that exhibition there. And uh, this, uh, this uh, institute was bombed on November 3rd. It was not destroyed, but one of the facade uh, was uh, damaged. Uh, and this is what actually got Macron so angry. Maybe you no noticed that uh, Macron in October was very much pro-Israeli. In November, he started to change a bit his tone. Not too much, but this has to do with this fact. There is a beautiful mansion that uh, I visited in Gaza and we wanted actually, when we were looking for a place to put our uh, center in Gaza, we thought of this place, but then we thought it may be too small for our work. It's a beautiful um, uh, 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 Ottoman uh, mansion 
uh, over 300 years old. Look in inside how it is. This mansion was fully destroyed on November 9th. I mean, this is Palestinian cultural heritage. Destroyed. And then you have this uh, state-of-the-art, brand new Arab Orthodox Cultural and Social Center. It's a $6 million project that was inaugurated just six months ago. They really haven't started fully with their uh, programs. Um, and um, on October 30th, there were, uh, there were 2,000 people, uh, uh, actually uh, women and children, having refuge there. Uh, they received uh, a call from the Israeli military. They have to evacuate the building, uh, which they did. And few hours later, Israel destroyed the whole building, empty building. Uh, everyone evacuated, uh, women and children, and yet it was fully destroyed. On October 19th, uh, the assembly hall of the Orthodox Church <coughs> was bombed. Uh, and actually, people were in there. Uh, there, were, uh, there were 50 uh, uh, Christian uh, uh, women, children, uh, men there, uh, uh, three families actually, uh, and uh, they bombed uh, the, that assembly hall and uh, 20 people were killed uh, and uh, 14 people were injured. I mean, to look who were there, I mean, you have these two uh, uh, sisters, uh, one of them pregnant, as you can see here to the left, uh, and their kids. Uh, an entire family uh, was whipped out uh, from the earth. Uh, and this, you know, these are not Hamas targets. I mean, these are uh, Greek Orthodox Christian who were, you know, uh, finding refuge there. But you can see uh, actually that Israel knows no boundary in this war and this is uh, their funeral i mean all the bodies 20 bodies were put like that and uh, the, the funeral and they were put in a mass uh, grave actually all of this are war crimes because intentionally directing attacks this is from uh, from the international humanitarian law. It says int intentionally directing attacks against building dedicated to religion. It's not only the assembly hall, 31 uh, mosques were destroyed. So dedicated to religion, education. I mean, the number of schools that were destroyed are in the hundreds. Art, I showed you some. Science or charitable purposes historic monuments, I showed you some hospitals and places where the sick and wounded are collected, provided they are not military objectives. So these are all war crimes that are happening and nobody actually talks about them a lot. And the last part is eye on art in Gaza. Because when you hear uh, this Israeli rhetoric, you think, uh, I mean, these people in Gaza are, I quote, barbarians. In fact, yesterday I was listening to uh, Farid Zakaria on CNN, my, one of my favorite uh, 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 programs, uh, and uh, he was interviewing Guterres. I'm not sure, maybe some of you have seen that. It was interesting. Guterres three times called uh, what happened on October 3rd barbarians. So actually he borrowed this dehumanizing language from Israel because they attacked him and now he wants to show that he is somehow uh, balanced. He didn't use the word barbarian as to what Israel is doing, which is interesting. So this is why I want to show you art life in Gaza. Here to the right, to the left, you have Renal Batrawi. Uh, she uh, is the director of our uh, uh, art center in Gaza a young uh, Palestinian accomplished uh, Gazan artist. 
And these are the tweets that I had from her uh, three weeks ago, which gives us an idea how people are every day uh, feeling and living. Uh, so she was putting that on her uh, on her Facebook. So I translate uh, in English. We received threatening calls. We have prepared our necessary items for evacuation at any time. She lives in Tel El Hawa, so that is the south uh, west part of Gaza City. For the first two hours, we are sitting, watching, thinking, and checking the safe places. The threat remains. And then interrupted sleep. She cannot sleep. We hardly sleep half an hour straight. Then we woke up in a haste. We stay hungry all the time. I don't know why. I mean, now they don't have food. At that time, they were still living in their home. They had food. Now there is no food. We are in a state of anticipation of any evacuation warning. After every strike, an earthquake underneath us shakes down. There is no electricity or internet. I connect with difficulty from a very bad external internet service connect. We cry and laugh with our children. We are afraid just like them, but we cannot, we can't hide it because they understand. We think every day how much and how to secure food and water. We try not to see all the pictures and videos to stay strong and resilient. And this last sentence actually brought tears into my eyes. She's saying, the last thing is, when I hear the sound of the missile coming down from a distance, I freak out. My husband tells me, when you hear it coming, it means it's not coming down on us. When it's headed towards us, it would be too late to hear it. And this is the view from her home. Every 10 to 15 minutes, another strike. And we suffocate from fear and from the smell of gunpowder. Rana uh, had to evacuate. So she left Tal El Hawa because that was totally bombarded. And now she is in the Khan Yunis area. Uh, but for 10 days, we didn't have any news from her. Every day I was checking, did she write me something? Did she send something? Uh, we were very worried. Uh, and this has become for me like every day, uh, the first thing I do when I woke up, are our people in Gaza still alive? Because not all of them, unfortunately, are alive. We lost several artists. One of them is Hiba Zakkud, murdered with her entire family on October 13th. Uh, this painting is done by her. Uh, two of her kids that we see here uh, were killed. Actually, two survived and two were killed. Another uh, one of our uh, volunteers, Mohammed Sami, uh, was murdered in an, Israel, in, in an Israeli strike on October 17th at Al Ahli Hospital. You remember, Al Ahli Hospital was the first hospital to be hit. A young man with visions, dreams for the future. Uh, and what he was doing at Al Ali Hospital, he was working with kids actually, teaching them songs about peace, just to calm them down. You can imagine how they, you know, for kids seeing all of these bombs falling around them. And he, as, uh, uh, as, as an artist, uh, he wanted to calm them, teaching them, uh, uh, hymns and there is actually uh, Al Jazeera did uh, were able to 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 film him singing that piece about pe uh, that piece on peace uh, at the hospital just two days before uh, he and the kids were killed in that strike and uh, a third artist we lost again one of our uh, volunteers uh, is uh, Halim al Kahlout uh, murdered on October 27th? Uh, she actually painted this uh, mural at our center in Gaza, uh, where you see uh, 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 um, Jerusalem and uh, uh, Abu Akhle, the journalist. And uh, what you see here, uh, do here uh, 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 painting with our kids. Uh, this was after the last war in Gaza. 
we were uh, we were developing programs for soci uh, uh, psychosocial uh, with all this you know bombing and so on uh, these kids i'm not sure how they are going to grow up uh, 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 seeing all of that so lots of work needs there to be done so we 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 lost again another one of our co-worker halima when I think of Gaza, I always think of this girl uh, at our center, uh, uh, looking into the future, not knowing what future actually is awaiting here. I'm not sure if she's still alive or not. And I would like to end with something just positive, not to leave you. I know that all of this is depressing, but... Um, uh, this painting to the uh, or this artwork to the right was done uh, last Sunday uh, at uh, the Roman Catholic Church in the Sunday school. Uh, kids in Gaza, they still have their dreams. We need to make sure that they will live to implement these dreams and to make these dreams come true. So please, justice, freedom, and peace is what Palestine needs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Mitri, for this extensive uh, presentation. Uh, this presentation sheds uh, light on the humanity of Gaza, the humanity that was absent in uh, in the media, in the mainstream media, in Western countries, and in the dehumanization of the Israeli government. Uh, I would like to open it to, uh, for questions. Maybe we can take uh, a few questions at this time, and I'll end it with a brief message from... Uh, uh, a personal message from me and from the MENA members. Uh, so if you would like to share with us some of your questions, we're only joined so far with, by uh, Professor Mitri, Dr. Mustafa. I don't know if he joined us uh, or not yet. Dr. Mustafa, are you here? So he's not here yet. If you have questions uh, that you'd like to direct to uh, Professor uh, Mitri, uh, please send it to us right now. So we can... Uh, Professor Mitri, until uh, someone um, sends us a question, can I ask you to elaborate on how uh, the people in Mila and Sister Networks and those with us in this meeting can actually contribute positively to what's going on right now in Gaza? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, uh, every one of us can do a lot. Uh, uh, one of the things is we need to keep uh, uh, telling the story, telling our story. That story often is being distorted by the media. Uh, um, uh, and uh, the more uh, genuine stories we tell, uh, the better it is. Second, we need to advocate. Uh, advocacy is very important. Uh, advocate our countries if you live in the United States or uh, wherever you live. Uh, uh, participation, participating in a demonstration is very important. You know, let me share with you the story when when uh, when the assembly hall of the Orthodox Church was bombed. I called like after a few minutes there uh, and uh, talked to my friend, and you can you can imagine uh, 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 he was I mean in shock. They thought the, the church is the the safest place in Gaza. It proved not. And then he told me, you know, take uh, here is sister. Uh, she wants uh, talk to her. She was screaming. I told her, uh, sister, we are praying for you. 
her answer was interesting. She said, stop praying. <laughs> now, I know prayers are important, but we need action. What is really needed now is action. Uh, we need people to go to the streets uh, to challenge their government. For, I mean, for God's sake, just for ceasefire, they cannot uh, agree on a ceasefire. Uh, after all of this death, all of these people injured. So advocacy is important uh, and we need uh, uh, your support. Uh, I mean, uh, because we need to rebuild Gaza. We need to give people in Gaza uh, hope. Uh, and and we need to advocate for for a political solution because without a, a just uh, and sustainable political solution, uh, it will be very difficult uh, for the people in Gaza to survive. Uh, Dr. Mitri, uh, someone asked about how they can uh, reach your to your documentation. Shall I refer them to your website? Yes, actually, on my website, you can see lots of, uh, uh, I mean, many, or, or if you are on LinkedIn, uh -huh. uh, you will find on LinkedIn uh, more, actually, presentations. Uh, uh, okay, I, I have just shared uh, your website, uh, uh in the chat uh, box. And uh, it seems like, People are interested in knowing uh, also about the donations. How can they uh, donate? And uh, what do you think are the best venues for these donations? And uh, do you think that they are going to actually reach uh, Gaza, given the fact that the uh, Rafah crossing is actually blocked and that even the Red Cross is not uh, allowed to function freely? Uh, during these uh, difficult moments by the Israeli army? Right, uh, that's that's the challenge right now. The only thing right now we can do uh, uh, is actually, uh, uh, for example, in our case, sending, uh, you know, salaries uh, for our staff and for other uh, artists in need. Uh, and because there are still few banks, very few who are functioning, I'm not sure for how long, uh, but now they are telling me we have cash, but we don't have food. So that is that is now becoming really the problem. Um, but um, it's important to be ready for the day after, because that day after will come and uh, we need to, uh, to work all together uh, uh, very fast, very efficient, uh, to make sure that uh, the people in Gaza uh, will really survive because now it's all a matter of survival. In fact, uh, on December 3rd, we are doing uh, a webinar and uh, with, with famous artists all over the world uh, to do a fundraising for the art community in Gaza. Is it a public uh, event? It is. Uh, it, it will be... Uh, it will be semi-public, but we can. I will share with Milia, with uh, with uh, Bedawi, uh, and with Doctor Iyad. I will share uh, the link. Uh, you are welcome uh, to, to to tune into uh, that. Mm -hmm. I'm sharing the question. I would like on, to also uh, the WhatsApp group between us, so you can uh, read from the questions that uh, people are posting. Yes, of course. Uh, hold on. You, uh, there is a question about Hamas and the perception of Hamas, uh, given that it is the leading, uh, leading the resistance movement in this war. How is it perceived in the West Bank? Uh, I guess it depends where you stand. Yeah. Uh, as you know, we, uh, as a Palestinian people, uh, uh, we have multiple political parties and uh, sometimes parties become like uh, tribes. So you are with your tribe, but, uh, but also many people are uh, supportive uh, of resistance. Uh, so it depends really where you stand. Uh, 
um, uh, I guess uh, uh, I, I hear that a majority is against uh, targeting civilians on, on any sides. So uh, for me, that is important because uh, we need to stick all to international law. Um, so that is, uh, yeah. Uh, I would like, to, guys, share, can I, yeah, can I I'd like to share a personal uh, take on how I personally perceive Hamas. And uh, it strikes me how people try to completely dehumanize every single member of Hamas and remove it from the the whole context of the of the conflict. Uh, I would like to tell the people that you know uh, many times resistance movements and armies around the world that you can go after every single member of these armies or these uh, movements and target them. Uh, in my opinion, every member of Hamas is a Palestinian. For those who don't know, 75% of the people in Gaza are refugees. When you're talking about members of Hamas, you need to remember that these are the childs and the grandchildren of refugees who are displaced from their homes, who are ethnically cleansed, who lived their entire life in a besieged area, and, sudden, and then you expect them to actually believe in, uh, in a moderate or a peaceful solution to a conflict but they are not. But and at the time when they are offered none, so uh, at the time when Israel is committing all these crimes, nobody is uh, is 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 using the term terrorism uh, on the Israeli army or its leaders. It's only the Palestinians who are facing the terror from the Israeli army that sees them as such, simply because the Israeli army rides in modern tanks and wears uniform does not make them. Uh, the good guys, as uh, as it is said in the media, where and at the same time, uh, hold on, I have a phone call from Doctor Baruti, Muhammad. So, uh, by the way, I think uh, it's important. I mean, part of the rhetoric right now is uh, uh, Netanyahu is uh, borrowing something from uh, George W. Bush. That that this is a, a, a fight between, between evil and, and evil. Yes. Exactly. And it and is not. Is, it is human beings that are serving in the Israeli army, but are, are misled by their government and implementing inhumane policies against the Gaza Strip. And I don't believe that every single uh, Israeli soldier has to be uh, uh, killed because I believe in my opinion, in my personal opinion, many of these guys are going to be part of my country, my partners in the future, free Palestine, Israel. And I don't want anyone to uh, use ge genocidal language against the members of the Palestinian resistance. I don't want them to be judged without uh, the context in which they were raised, in which they lived. So uh, it's very important to look at the Palestinian-Israeli situation with, with, a, with a broad perspective that takes into consideration the history, the suffering. And it's not to, to justify any act from any side, because I'm personally totally against the attack against uh, any of the civilians. But at the same time, if we want to really see the light at the end of the tunnel, if we want to come to a peaceful resolution, we will have to, at one point, put a human face to all these elements, to the Israeli soldier, to the Hamas member, and bring the politicians uh, that led to these massacres, to these atrocities, to court. But in order to do that, we'll have to start by providing the Palestinians with the basic human rights. We cannot live with, in complete deprivation, uh, without any rights, without any dignity, under a brutal occupation, denied all our rights, and uh, fearing for to be uh, ex expelled from our countries, as we are seeing right now in Gaza, and 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 yet uh, be expected to always act rationally, to always denounce violence, it is not going to happen. We are going to resist, and many times, occasionally, we will do it. Most of the time, we do it peacefully, and occasionally, there will be some violence. And. Uh, this is how things are. But if you want to be a positive force in resolving this conflict, then you'll have to start 
by, by recognizing the imbalance of power, the imbalance of the responsibilities, by uh, implementing international legitimacy and human rights resolutions, and later on, uh, trial everybody for the mistakes that they commit from that point on. I would want like to, uh, to 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 move to more questions, but this was my personal take since uh, I also happen to live in the West Bank, and uh, and as Doctor Mitri, uh, Professor Mitri said, you know, crimes are taking place in Gaza, but here in the West Bank we are suffering so much these days, and uh, during the uh, the uh, the last few decades. But the problem is you haven't been hearing about it. The media hasn't been telling you about it. These days, every night, soldier Israeli uh, armored vehicles are entering every city uh, in the West Bank. More than 180 uh, people in the West Bank have been shot dead. This morning, a taxi driver was shot dead as Israeli armored vehicles entered the city of Hebron. Uh, more than 40 children in the West Bank have been shot dead. Settlers are at the, uh, every uh, road crossing, attacking Palestinian cars, threatening them with guns, attacking their villages. We, until this point, we are not allowed to go down to our olive uh, lands to, to collect the olives. This is the olive season. It is very important in Palestine. It's a historical season. And the settlers are threatening our villagers, our, uh, uh, our landowners, that they will not be allowed to collect the olives. So this, this, this year, the season of olive oil will be catastrophic in the West Bank. The olives are still on the trees, and in many cases, the settlers are stealing our olives, are cutting our trees. So, uh, so yeah, our life is violent, and uh, there will be always violence. We need to recognize the imbalance of power, go with international legitimacy, provide human rights for everybody, and then question and judge uh, who does not uh, commit to a peaceful resolution. Um, there is a question here about the evangelical church uh, in the United States mostly. So uh, the question reads as, uh, as following. In the US, the evangelical church and majority of Christians have always supported the state of Israel and Jewish people in Israel because it's viewing the Holy Land from the biblical perspective. How do we, uh, as Christian community and priests in the Middle East, especially, reach out to Christian communities in the U.S. to break this blind support to Israel? I mean, uh, this is what I do 24-7, uh, basically. Um, and we have to distinguish, actually, several uh, 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 different uh, kinds of churches. The mainline churches in the U.S. are actually uh, very much in support of Palestine. Our problem is with the so-called evangelicals. Uh, many of them are what we call Christian Zionists uh, because they believe that, uh, not because they love the Jews, by the way. Uh, actually, they are the most anti-Semite, if you want, because they want all the Jews to come to Palestine. Two-thirds of them will be killed. One-third will uh, convert to Christianity, and then Jesus will come. That's, that's in a nutshell, what they believe. And so... Uh, so they don't love the Jewish people, but they want uh, basically uh, the second coming to come sooner ra rather than later. Uh, uh, so uh, in the States, uh, we have been working, as I said, uh, uh, tirelessly uh, to change. And there is a change. Uh, even among evangelicals, the last poll shows that young evangelicals tend to be more on the Palestinian side because they are interested in justice. And if you talk about justice, there is no other just case like Palestine, cause like Palestine. And so, uh, yeah, the older generation, you know, they have still many racist ideas and then you have Islamophobia, you have uh, Orientalism, etc., which works uh, against us. Uh, and again, if you uh, uh, see some of my books, uh, the last book about decolonizing uh, Palestine actually tackles exactly this one issue. I thought there were some other really good questions, uh, by the way. Yeah. Uh, there was one question saying, 
how best to tell the stories um, how can we best tell the stories and in your view uh, is anyone with power listening yes uh, we need to we need to keep telling them even if uh, nobody is listening but i i see that uh, yes there are more people listening the thing is and this is our problem the israeli they have a whole machine uh, doing exactly that telling the israeli story we weren't able as Palestinians to create that machine. Uh, and, and the Israeli people uh, are very well trained. I mean, uh, two days ago, there was a Palestinian uh, former politician on CNN. He interviewed him for like seven minutes. If you tell me what he said, I cannot remember one word. He was talking about everything and nothing. Uh, the Israeli, they come with clear uh, uh, talking points, one, two, three, and they keep repeating them. The more they repeat them, the people think it's, it's, uh, it's true, though they are fake news. This is what Trump actually figured out. You know, you keep telling uh, a lie and then people think it's, uh, it's true. And so we need to learn not, not to, take, uh, to talk uh, fake news, but we need to to know how to how to speak to media, how to speak to people abroad, because often I feel we as Palestinians we keep speaking to ourselves mm -hmm. in a language that actually people abroad they don't understand. This is why in my in my presentation I was thinking maybe we have more people from the U.S., North America, and and so on. I, I discovered that the majority are here from the region. Uh, but we need to tell human stories. People connect to humans. Yeah, uh, like to... This is this is very important. Uh, we need to give a face to our people. We need to give a name to the uh, victims, um, and we need to lift up uh, the the beauty of Palestine. You know, often we we talk about only depressing things. I did that today because it's about Gaza and this is the context. But but we need to lift all these great people uh, uh, that Palestine have and to 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 celebrate them. And people will start uh, listening. And you know, I had I mean, uh, I go to to Congress at least twice a year, talking to Congress people. It's very difficult to to convince Congress people, not because. Uh, they don't want to understand or to listen, but because they don't want to sacrifice their career on the no. altar of Palestine. I don't blame them, unfortunately, but this is... So So, what incentives can we give them? Uh, how can we make sure that, um, uh, that uh, they can move, maybe not 100%, but slowly, you know? So, and we had some... Uh, some some victories, small victories there. Mm -hmm. I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Mustafa Darwuti. He's back with us. And uh, uh, I would like to ask, uh, to direct one of the questions to you, Dr. Mustafa. And this is actually the question that all of us ask. You know, in, uh, when the Nakba took place in 1948, uh, one of the excuses that we give to the world is that, you know, many people did not know that it happened. Uh, things happened uh, at an era when media was not as fast as uh, today. But the shock of the Palestinian younger generation is that these things can happen and are happening to us in this era when, when we are reporting the massacres live from our uh, uh, phones. So the question is, how are these things happening? Happening. How are these massacres happening with clear social media documentation in 2023? Well, uh, it's a very good question, but I have to make a, confes a, a confession here. I think uh, I personally, like so many other people, believed that uh, in the 21st century, uh, it is impossible to conduct ethnic cleansing again. And I was wrong. Uh, I must also confess to the fact that we have been uh, deceived 
by all the stock uh, uh, by all the stock from the western governments in particular and western countries about the values of democracy and human rights and so on. Uh, there is a lot here to be examined and uh, it's not it's not a coincidence what we see today two particular things the level of double standard that is unprecedented look in the case i don't know if you've spoken about this but in the case of ukraine they give 224 billion dollars of military equipment of aid of support etc and they say that they're helping ukraine fight occupation and they say that they impose on russia 11000 punitive acts claiming that this is because Russia is is, is uh, annexing occupied territory. Although we know, I mean, I don't want to go into this, but there is a different historical context here. But in our case, they give the money and the support to the occupier, and they support the occupier. So what is the conclusion? The conclusion uh, is, is three things. First of all, we have to realize and understand and uh, and believe uh, what we sometimes try to avoid believing in, uh, which is that what, what moves countries and governments and many people, especially politicians in particular, mm -hmm. and people in business, is their interest, not principles, not values. It's very clear. It's the interest that moves these people mostly. Second thing is that we don't live, the world does not live, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union and uh, then the domination of one uh, of the United States, one superpower. Now we're moving into multipolar system. The world doesn't abide by international law. Unfortunately, the message that is going out from what's happening in Palestine is very dangerous. It's beyond the issue of Palestine and Israel. It's about telling the world of the, the people of the world that we the world does not live by the international law, but by the law of jungle, which means you have the power, you can do what you want. That doesn't mean that I lost hope in humanity. On the contrary, these huge demonstrations that you see everywhere in Europe in particular has moved things and changed things. They forced the French government to change its position. So the people is one thing and the government is something else. But the third point is that we as Palestinians, and I know that many of the participants here are Palestinians, have to learn to be better organized and have to learn how we can work in teams. Our big problems is that we have so many intellect, so, so many talented people, so many successful people in different fields, but they find great difficulty working together in organization or in, in a team exactly opposite from what the Israelis do. And the Israelis have had a long period of suffering because of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism and so on. It forced them. It forced them to become well organized and linked to each other. Exactly. That's what we need today. And uh, what happened today is not, is not a joke. You're talking about the possibility of total ethnic cleansing of Gaza, which we have to stand up to and prevent. But they want to do the same in the West Bank. So mm -hmm. the problem is not finished, and it will not be finished if the war stops tomorrow. We're talking about a Zionist movement that wants to ethnically cleanse all Palestinians from all Palestine. And that's why I call on you, because it's, we're very good at telling others what they should do, but we're weak in telling ourselves what we should do. I am calling on you to tell yourselves what can each of you do to organize better and cooperate better with the rest of us so that we can promote the Palestinian issue and we can prevent this terrible ethnic cleansing from taking place. Um, there are a few questions, Dr. Darwuti, which are uh, circling around the same point, which is the role of the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian security apparatus in the West Bank. How do you see their role, their involvement, and uh, are they living up to the, to the situation? No, the answer is no. The PA is very passive, uh, shame, yeah, in a very shameful manner, as a matter of fact. 
Uh, and the speech that we heard on their behalf in the summit was not really up to the standard that should be, especially that it was the first speech in the Arabs Islamic summit. Uh, the PA is very passive. You can see how many of them are speaking out about what's happening in Gaza. And uh, uh, there is a, a, a very big problem with the Palestinian Authority because we lack democracy, because we didn't have elections in 2021, because we don't have separation of powers, because we don't have a functioning parliament, and because they did not allow elections to happen. Uh, they say because Israel prevented them in Jerusalem. We know that Israel was against free democratic elections, but we also know that the United States was against free democratic elections in Palestine. But the PA was not interested in having the elections. And, and what we have today in terms of internal division is one direct result of the fact that we didn't have free democratic choice since 2006. And the Palestinian people have the right to choose their leaders in a free democratic manner. This is a question that we have to deal with after we manage to stop this terrible war. But uh, in my opinion, the Palestinian Authority is not doing its job. The security apparatus, which is consuming 40% of the Palestinian budget, is not doing anything to protect the Palestinians. The least they can do, in my opinion, I'm not expecting them to carry guns and attack Israelis, but at least they should be with villagers when they harvest olive and uh, prevent the settlers from attacking them, provide at least the minimum of protection to the Palestinian people. So unfortunately, we have a security structure that is supposed to protect any Israeli that comes inside the, uh, the cities by mistake and protect them, but they are unable to protect our own people from the same occupiers. Uh, that's why I think the internal Palestinian situation needs a huge reform. And uh, the only way out of this situation is really through democratic, <clears throat> through democratic participation. We should not allow now, and, and one big flaw here is that the Palestinian Authority should do much more in terms of preventing what the Israelis are trying to do, like any colonial power, which is use the, 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 the strategy of divide and conquer. They are trying to divide us and conquer us. That's, that has been the, their, their approach. Uh, some people had the illusion uh, that Israel will, will, uh, will eliminate Hamas in Gaza, bring down the government of Hamas in Gaza, and then bring the Palestinian Authority to govern Gaza. Netanyahu made it very clear two days ago. He said he will not allow any Palestinian Authority in Gaza because the real plan of Netanyahu is to annex Gaza. Believe me, this man hoped that he will evict everybody to Egypt destroy everything in Gaza, and then annex it to Israel, and then say it's a security area for Israel. And he didn't hide his intentions. He stood up in the United Nations weeks before the war started and showed the world the map. And the map of Israel included the annexation of the Golan Syrian Heights, the annexation of all of the West Bank, and the annexation of Gaza Strip, at the time when Israel was claiming that it has withdrawn from Gaza. So he said there is no space or place for any Palestinian authority whatsoever. He even attacked Mr. Abbas and said that he supported Hamas. And, and that's the game he has been playing. When Palestinians tried to unify themselves, he would say that Palestinians are dealing with terrorists. And when we are divided, he says, I, have nothing, I cannot talk to any Palestinian leader because they don't represent everybody. So the game here that Netanyahu came to power to kill the possibility of two-state solution, it is well known, it's well documented. And he is now, he's not interested in bringing the bad authority to Gaza. And that is an additional motivation, I think, incentive to the PA to change its approach and stand up with its own people. And my call to them, which I said it clearly and openly uh, more than a week ago, that the PA must call for a meeting of all Palestinian forces and, and establish some kind of unified leadership now temporarily till we have free democratic elections. That's what we need, and that is what is needed. Uh, but I, I do agree that, uh, unfortunately, they have not been up to the standard. But that also applies to Arab leaders, to be honest with you. You know what Netanyahu said today? He said, I advise all the Arab leaders 
if they want to protect their interests, to stay silent. That's the level of his, his uh, arrogance in dealing with Arab countries because they fail even in doing a little thing, which is to enforce a supply of humanitarian aid through Rafah checkpoint, which Israel has no right whatsoever to be controlling. Uh, Dr. Mitri, given your role as a member, as an elected member of the Palestinian National Council and Palestinian Central Council, can you please elaborate on uh, uh, on the same question that was directed uh, to Dr. Mustafa regarding the role of the authority and uh, our role as people who live in as Palestinians in the West Bank in bringing change? You are on mute, doctor. Yeah, I, I think that unity now is uh, is very, very important. Uh, without uh, unifying all political forces uh, and uh, uh, and um, and having like um, almost like a renewed PLO uh, that is inclusive. Uh, with uh, with young uh, people, young blood, uh, I think that is our challenge right now, um, uh, and this is where we need to work. Otherwise, I guess um, it will be very difficult to deal with the huge challenge that is uh, coming towards us. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, since we are running out of time, uh, I would like to ask. Uh, our two speakers for their uh, uh, final remarks. If we can start with uh, Dr. Mustafa Barghouti. Any final message to our audience tonight? Uh, I don't have much to add. I'm sorry I could not be with you all the time, but, uh, uh, but I, I have one message to all of you. Uh, there are lots of details that we need to discuss, uh, and but as uh, my my friend, my close friend Mitri said, uh, we need to make our message short and clear. At this very moment, I want to ask each of you and every one of you to use everything you have in your in your in your ability to push for an immediate ceasefire, to push for an immediate stop of this atrocity against the people of Gaza. We need to stop this war. And that means exercising any possible pressure, especially on the United States of America, and especially on the governments uh, in, in the region to, to take steps towards pressuring the United States so that it would stop the atrocity that is taking place now. And to me now, the most immediate goal is ceasefire because the people are dying. As I said, every four minutes, we are losing a Palestinian. Every seven minutes, a child is dying. Every 10, every 15 minutes, a woman is dying. Our people are dying from thirst and from hunger and from lack of oxygen. And the children are dying in hospitals because there is no electricity. 28,000 injured people don't have treatment because there, is, there are no medicines and, and, and no supplies. Uh, it's a total, 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 uh, very dangerous humanitarian disaster, and it cannot be stopped unless we stop this war. So the most important call for all of you is to do everything you can in your capacity to demand and push for immediate ceasefire. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa. Uh, Professor Mitri, uh, your final uh, words to uh, our audience? Yeah. Um... Actually, the same like uh, Dr. Mustafa. Uh, people ask me, uh, where is hope today uh, in, in this very difficult uh, situation uh, in New Nakba? Uh, and for me, hope is not something uh, that we have to wait for uh, to see. Uh, hope is what we do. I guess uh, often we were just sitting there uh, waiting for hope. Uh, I'm, I'm really sometimes frustrated uh, when I talk to our young people, they sit in front of Al Jazeera uh, six, eight hours uh, a day, 
which is really not the best way to, to, to do right now because we need them to action. Action is what is needed. And every one of us can do uh, a little. It's, it's the many, the little steps that the little people in so many places do that will make a, a change. Uh, and uh, and we need to work together towards a, a different uh, future uh, for our people. Uh, we uh, we are facing almost the whole world. Uh, what Russia has been facing for two years, we have been facing for hundred years, uh, and yet we prevailed. And with this sumud, this idea that we are here and nobody will be able to wipe us out. Uh, we will continue to be resilient. Uh, we will con continue to be steadfast. And we will continue to work. I think this is my message to everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Mitri. Uh, thank you, our speakers, for a wonderful presentation. And uh, thank you for all the, uh, the participants for your uh, time. I hope you learned a lot with us tonight and I hope that uh, the messages that uh, that you got from us will actually uh, incite you to uh, to take action. As, Dr. As Professor Mitri said, small action matters and it can uh, stop the killing of a child, it can bring life back, it can uh, support families in need and uh, it can help us bring a better future to uh, to Palestine. But Dawid, uh, can I add something, please? Yes. Go ahead, please. Well, since we talk about practical things, I have to, to say that. We, we have 21 teams now, medical teams working in Gaza as okay. a Palestinian medical relief. And uh, you know what uh, many Western countries did? Uh, many of them used to support the work of the medical work we are doing. Uh, since the 7th of October, they declared that they are stopping all support to the 76 Palestinian non-governmental organizations working in Palestine. They are suspending it, mm -hmm. which this means... Mostly European countries or... Italy, Switzerland, Germany, Sweden, Sweden. European Union, mm -hmm. and Germany. Uh, so that's that's why I'm saying, I mean... Imagine our medical teams working under these difficult conditions, and now that you, you tell them you don't have salaries, you don't have support, you never. We will not stop working, even if we if we have nothing. But I'm calling on you also, one of the things you could do is to support Palestinian civil society and uh, not to let them stop, not to let it collapse because of uh, these acts of collective punishment. I call them acts of collective punishment against the Palestinian people. Thank mm -hmm. you. I would. Uh, we are going to work on um, a small document in which we will share information about. Uh, uh, first of all, resources for information for those who want to learn more about the situation, and also ways they can help. So uh, I will get in touch uh, with both of our speakers. Get information on. Uh, uh, possible ways that our participants can actually uh, donate, uh, cooperate, and even volunteer uh, with Palestinian civil society uh, organizations. Uh, on my final remark, I would like to apologize for all those who wrote, uh, sent questions and uh, and we could not uh, accommodate it within this time. Uh, on my final remark, I would like to stress on the hope that we need to we need to take action. We need to stay hopeful, uh, and we need to uh, to believe uh, that justice will prevail at one point, and that uh, the justice for Palestinians will only happen if uh, the entire people of the world uh, committed to it. The justice in Palestine is related to the justice uh, in all over the world. Mandela said it before that the justice of South Africa was incomplete without justice in Palestine. And I believe uh, it, is, uh, it is very uh, telling that uh, the, the Palestine right today is at the center uh, of the attention of everyone around the world. And I believe that it is, it is time to take action. And uh, as an individual, your action is very important. I thank you again. Uh, the Palestine chapter 
uh, counts on you to 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 take action, to educate people around you, and to help in all ways that you can. Thank you again, and uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Nida. Shukran. Thank you.